Hello, my name is Blair Stonechild, and I've, uh, I'm a longtime employee uh, of First Nations University. I started here in 1976, so I've been around for a while. I'm uh, a member of the Muscopeding Soto First Nation, and, uh, but uh, I uh, spent a lot of my time um, off-reserve, growing up off-reserve, but uh, I did also attend the Capel Indian Residential School from uh, the time that I was uh, in kindergarten up to grade nine. So I definitely know what the residential schools are about and I know what the, you know, what the whole process of, uh, I guess you might say indoctrination is, the whole idea of, um, of abuse and the idea that I kind of have started to look at closely, which is the phenomenon of spiritual abuse that has been identified by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Well, I actually have five books so far, but I'll talk about the ones that have to do with uh, spirituality. Uh, the first one is this one. It's called The Knowledge Seeker, Embracing Indigenous Spirituality, which was uh, came out in, in 2016. And um, I uh, can uh, talk a bit more about it, but essentially it, uh, it is a book which was uh, done, obviously, with the uh, support and the information from elders. Uh, there were over a dozen elders that I contacted with using proper protocol and you know they were actually quite happy to help me in terms of uh, developing this book. As a matter of fact a number of them told me that it really needed to be written and uh, they said it was important so to me this was a very important contribution to an area which is not being adequately researched or written about and so I'm you know feel that this uh, is a uh, you know, certainly, a, I think, a, a unique and an important contribution because, to me, spirituality is really foundational to everything. It's foundational to education. Certainly in our traditional culture, it was foundational. The um, idea of uh, spirituality, appreciating the notion of spirit and spirituality was uh, really the cornerstone of, of all of the culture and, and knowledge systems, as far as I understand. This book is actually just coming out now in March of 2020, and it's called Loss of Indigenous Eden and the Fall of Spirituality. This book is a follow-up of sorts to The Knowledge Seeker. After I had written The Knowledge Seeker, uh, people, you know, many people, of course, appreciated that I, what I had done. It said that it helped them to understand a lot about the nature of Indigenous spirituality and, you know, what it, uh, what it says and what it means. But there were uh, others who questioned whether it was still relevant today, you know, what was the relevance of, of Indigenous spirituality anymore. So that motivated me to write this book, which talks about, I guess you might say, sort of like the place of Indigenous spirituality in terms of history and the way that it's still relevant today. Well, it's something to me that has, has been neglected inadvertently, I'd say. I know when the First Nations first started as Saskatchewan Indian Federated College. Much of our emphasis was on things like history, for example, understanding the history of treaties and recovering the rights and things like language, obviously, language recovery, um, cultural information. But the uh, part about spirituality was sort of not really focused on that much. Some of the elders back then, I think, maybe felt that wasn't the right time. Maybe there was some fear that, you know, it uh, maybe didn't fit into a university setting or maybe there was some fear that it might be appropriated or something to that effect. But, um, you know, now we're 40 years into the history of First Nations University and the things are changing. The uh, elders that I've worked with here are, have told me that, you know, it's the time is right. The time It's important now to be able to explain, you know, the ideas and, and um, you know, how the, what the practices mean in terms of Indigenous spirituality. Uh, a lot of it is because of the concern of uh, off-reserve, uh, you know, especially the youth uh, who are, um, you know, the elders say that they're losing the direction and as a result they're becoming involved in, you know, things like drugs and gangs and so on and so forth. And so the... Um, <clears throat> 
you know, part of the thing, of course, is that spirituality traditionally was uh, something which was a very personal thing, and it, uh, you know, often involved a lot of protocol, long time learning with elders to get the spiritual information and a lot of involvement in ceremonies. But uh, times are changing, obviously, and, uh, you know, our culture and our approach needs to change. That's, uh, that's what the elders are telling me. They're saying that, um, you know, it's okay to talk about these things in English. It's okay to write about them in books. As a matter of fact, some elders have been very adamant that, uh, you know, that these books get done as quickly as possible. And so it is, uh, in my mind, at least from our traditional point of view, it's foundational because, you know, we consider ourselves to be very spiritual beings. You know, we really, as the elders explained it to me, we are actually spirit beings first and we're spirit beings on a physical journey. And so, you know, we come from spirit and we return to spirit. And in our traditional indigenous lifestyles, in our education system, you know, we were taught about our identity as spirit beings. You know, we were, you know, we were taught that, you know, every every created thing had its own spirit, and that, uh, you know, there were spirit beings, spirit helpers. There's the ancestors. There's the creator. And that, uh, <clears throat> you know, they are not only real forces, but that they could be communicated with. And this was, to me, this was the source of our wisdom and our grounding in traditional culture, whereas today. You know, we live in what's called a secular world. We live in what's called the age of reason. And uh, because of this, uh, people don't really take, um, I guess you might say, very serious um, consideration of spirituality. In fact, uh, the age of reason pretty well explicitly rules out things having to do with spirit or spirituality. It all boils down to the so-called rational mind, right, that you know, using our brains and our reason, we can solve all the problems ourselves, which I think uh, it's becoming more and more evident that that simply is not working. Well, it's been a long journey for me. I mean, I've been working here at First Nations University for over 40 years. I came out of the residential school system, and like most students who, survivors who came out of that system, we were pretty well indoctrinated. You know, we uh, experienced intense, I don't know if you want to call it brainwashing, but uh, certainly exposure to Christianity, all the prayers and rosaries and masses and confessions and, you know, you name it, we uh, certainly, you know, that was an integral part of the residential school system. And I would say that back in the 50s and 60s when I was at residential school, indigenous spirituality was largely a still an underground phenomenon. As a matter of fact, you know, one time the uh, Indian Act actually outlawed things like ceremonies. And uh, so it became a question of, uh, as I began working at the First Nations University, you know, and listening to the elders, I started to become aware that, you know, there's a much different attitude towards all of these uh, areas and aspects of spirituality and religion. And, um, you know, I began to question, I guess I'd always sort of never been totally happy with, you know, what I'd heard in residential school. There always, to me, seemed to be something that was, you know, not quite, something, something either missing or not quite, you know, meaningful to, to me as, uh, you know, as a person trying to understand what life was about and, you know, how you could apply these things, uh, you know, in a meaningful way. And so I spent a lot of had the wonderful opportunity to spend a lot of time listening to elders over the years, and um, I can't actually say that I fully understood what they were saying right off the bat. It's kind of uh, in little, uh, you know, sort of little dri dribs and drabs that I started to appreciate fully what what they were saying, and to get a bigger picture of what it was all about. One of the first elders I met when I started working at uh, the uh, Saskatchewan Indian Federated College was. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Ernest Tatusis. And um, he used to say, tell me something that always stuck in the back of my mind. He, used, he said, you know, we First Nations people used to live in the Garden of Eden. And he said, we never abused the gifts of the Creator. For some reason, that always stuck in the back of my mind. And 
than uh, many other elders. And uh, here I, well, I guess I should mention that back around 2005, maybe even a bit later, I was um, sort of casting around for research as, you know, we're supposed to do. And, um, you know, I'd had sort of experiences that always been interested in, you know, sort of trying to understand other parts of consciousness, you know, like the, you know, whether, it's, you know, like spirituality and dreams and all that type of thing. And so I had an opportunity to begin a research project on spirituality. And um, so I started asking the elders. I interviewed about a dozen elders, and I'd ask them simple questions like, where do we come from? You know, what's our purpose for living? Uh, what, uh, you know, what, what are the important things that, you know, we're supposed to be doing as, uh, you know, as human beings? And so this uh, produced a wonderful um, set of, of uh, interviews and information. And uh, in particular, I uh, really appreciate in particular uh, the um, contribution of, uh, of uh, De Elder Danny Mosco, who is a you know, very well-loved elder who worked here at, uh, at First Nations University for 25 years. And uh, definitely a very um, accomplished uh, philosopher, I guess you might say, in terms of learning the, you know, like the, the, the spiritual philosophy that he learned from a very young age. And, you know, he's kept in the oral tradition. And when I interviewed him, he just laid out an entire body, a systematic body of knowledge, which really helped me to understand what the whole thing was about. And just the way he laid it out was so simple. And in the Knowledge Seeker, I begin by um, talking about what I talk about, the, the great principle, which is, you know, sort of what's in some ways, you know, the most um, basic thing you have to know. And he explained to me as a quote, what Kotwin, and I know not everybody kind of interprets what Kotwin the same way, but to me, the way he explained it basically is that, you know, you, if, if you ever hope to understand indigenous spirituality, you have to understand this principle about us being spirit beings on a physical journey. And uh, if you don't sort of um, grasp that part of it about taking the spiritual part of uh, being seriously and treating it uh, with uh, respect and recognizing, you know, its, uh, its uh, existence and relevance, you can't really, you won't really make much progress beyond that. So that, that was the that was the first thing I, you know, in, in terms of um, trying to interpret this teaching, I call it the great principle. The second one is the question of, you know, what are we supposed to, why, why are we here? You know, what are we, what are we supposed to be uh, achieving in life? And so that I interpret as uh, Mia Wichadwin, and it's uh, the, it's also can be referred to as a great law or the great law. And it's the, the uh, essentially the great law of relationships. Essentially, says that when we come to physical to experience the physical world, essentially we're here to learn. We wanted to learn. The Creator gave us permission to to come into the earth, and uh, you know, again, you know, these are kind of um, perhaps controversial concepts, but you know, I understand that from uh, what uh, the elders have told me that, uh, you know, we are not beings who evolve from some sort of primordial soup or we're not sort of evolved intelligent apes, but rather we're spirit beings. And we, you know, we came to Earth as spirit beings and, you know, we, we sort of came to, um, you know, to inhabit these uh, hominid bodies which are here. And this is, our, this is our, I guess you might say, has become our vehicles for experiencing this physical life. And so we essentially, you know, I guess we're not perfect spirits. We're, you know, we have, you know, we, we have to learn how to uh, live within these bodies. We need to learn how to control them. We need how to learn how to control the emotions that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that are there. Uh, 
and we need to learn how to live harmoniously with a natural life, but we also need, also need to learn how to obviously learn how to live harmoniously between ourselves as humans, but also with the spirit world. You know, we need to respect the uh, spirit beings that are there, whether they're our ancestors or, you know, the guardian spirits of, uh, of nature or whether it's, uh, you know, other grandfather spirits that we uh, need to, you know, we need to respect them and, you know, uh, keep grounded by, uh, through ceremonies, for example, ceremonies which, you know, gave us that ability to, you know, to keep it connected with them. And um, so this uh, gives us, uh, you know, from the indigenous point of view, this gives us a sense, a sense of being. It gives us a sense of purpose. And, uh, you know, it gives us a sense of spiritual integrity. And uh, there are many other things which are laid out in terms of our spiritual philosophy, things like, you know, the seven virtues, which actually were, uh, were laws, right? They weren't just vir virtues, they were actually laws that people were expected to live up to. Things like the seven spiritual disciplines, you know, fasting and meditation and dreams and visions and teaching and learning and parenting and all of these types of things that, um, you know, are, are ways in which we, you know, learn how to, how to live fulfilling lives. And uh, so, yeah, these things I laid out uh, in the uh, Knowledge Seeker book. Well, the Knowledge Seeker book is, uh, you know, from all I've heard, has really um, been received well because, uh, you know, as you mentioned, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, sort of uh, another way, I guess, to articulate uh, what the... Uh, Elders are saying, and you know, like the elders uh, traditionally, um, you know, they were not trained to be classroom teachers. You know, they were, you know, trained to sort of, uh, um, you know, to part to impart uh, knowledge uh, as uh, people sought it, and to provide good examples, and you know, to instruct, you know, to, you know, to help instruct the um, the young and all that type of thing, but. You know, in the type of world we live in, you know, people expect and demand that these things be kind of be given to them under <laughs> two covers, right? And so that's more or less what I've done. And, um, you know, I've um, heard that, uh, you know, it's well received. I know that social work is uh, used in my book a lot. And um, I've heard that teachers have really appreciated it. And so, you know, it, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's uh, I think, a very useful uh, curriculum material. It uh, certainly can be used at the university level. I think it's also appropriate for uh, the high school level. And I think it uh, would be a good resource for, for example, teachers who are, you know, like at the elementary level, let's say, and they want, uh, you know, some sort of curriculum material. And, uh, of course, it's uh, very accessible generally to the general public. You know, I've had, uh, you know, people just almost at random sort of pick it up and, you know, tell me that, uh, you know, they found it... Uh, very, uh, very useful, and I've gotten good ratings on Amazon. So, what can you say, right? Well, I think, as I said, it fills a very important, what I would consider to be a gap in uh, Indigenous studies and in the study of Indigenous knowledge generally. And uh, I know even at universities, there is this gap. You know, and I know at some universities there's still hesitation to speak about indigenous spirituality fully because in some cases actually, the, you know, from what I understand, the elders aren't quite comfortable yet, you know, especially in the bigger universities that, you know, perhaps this knowledge will be received respectively or, if, you know, if it's received it might not be used properly. I don't know. But uh, here I guess we're, you know, we're lucky because it's a, First Nations uh, controlled institution and we have a lot of elders and and that type of thing so and uh, generally in terms of what you might call um, indigenous knowledge and philosophy people still tend to interpret it in many ways I know some people when they talk about indigenous knowledge like they like to talk about things like traditional ecological knowledge stuff like that which has to do with you know for example our relationship with the land you know how do how we use plants traditionally or, you know, medicines, nothing, but, but, you know, that's not the full picture, you know, that's not the full picture, the full picture, the, you know, the full picture, the, um, 
basic picture is what I was talking about. It's this whole idea of, of spirit and spirituality. And, um, you know, it's uh, to me as I've, uh, for example, did my research for loss of Indigenous Eden, it becomes very evident what's happened over the last particularly 200 years, this loss of appreciation for spirituality, and it's not an accident. It's something which has been very intentional on the part of, um, you know, like the forces that have been at work colonizing the world and creating sort of like the, you know, the kind of economic and social system we have. And so, um, you know, as I um, <clears throat> look at this, uh, this phenomenon and, you know, like in, in writing the Loss of Indigenous Eden book, I was uh, asking myself the question, you know, where did this divergence, where did this difference originate? You know, where did, where did, when did it happen? Where did it happen that all of a sudden, you know, we, we had indigenous cultures that were very spiritual, and then all of a sudden, you know, we have the persecution of indigenous, indigenous people, right? We have the disrespect for indigenous spirituality, all of that. So where did that happen? And that was, you know, that was a central question, actually, for me when I d did the research. And so in doing that, I found myself having to go further and further back. And I, of course, uh, you know, looked at residential schools and... You know, it's obvious uh, that, uh, you know, that um, conflict existed. If you go back even further to contact with North America, it's very, very clear that there was this difference in ideology that existed between, you know, those who so-called discovered North America and indigenous peoples. And so I ended up uh, looking at the old world and um, going further and further back, looking at what was happening. And finally, I came to what was called the rise of civilization 6,000 years ago. And I was reading the you know, the books, I had about a half a dozen books on it, and they all basically said the same thing. It's very clear, and, uh, you know, the, the, the answer to my question actually was provided very simply by you know, what, what was explained as the definition of civilization. And uh, it, it is said that civilization arose when humanity decided to rise up and conquer nature. And so I, right away, it was, that was my aha moment. You know, I said, that's not what indigenous people are at all believe. This is... This would be heresy in indigenous circles, right? Because, you know, we viewed, uh, you know, the creation as the gift of the creator, the gifts of the creator, it sustains us. You know, we were told, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, these, uh, all of the created beings are our spiritual relatives. And, you know, when we pray, we talk about, about them as our relatives. And, uh, you know, we're to live harmoniously with them. We're, we're to be stewards. You know, we have no right to dominate them because we're so dependent on them. You know, we should be approaching our existence here with humility and thankfulness. And, um, you know, nature should not be scary. It's not something that's out to, to get us. But that's the, that's the premise of uh, civilization. And so, you know, civilization results in, you know, the domination of nature, the, you know, hoarding of plants and animals. And uh, along with that, you get the phenomenon of uh, basically empire building, right? You find the you know, the origins of, of wars, for example, occur in uh, Samaria and, and uh, you know, Middle East and other places. And as time goes on, you see this ideology of uh, what I called um, human centeredness and, uh, you know, the, you know, the, uh, you know, the grasping for increasing amounts of wealth and power and uh, competition over resources. You see it happening uh, with uh, the so-called great civilizations, right, like the Greeks and Romans, and, and um, you know, uh, it, it goes on and on. And so uh, the, you know, it, it, it becomes, in my book, The Loss of Indigenous Eden, I basically talk about it as a uh, conflict between what I, you know, what was uh, an indigenous ideology, which existed from the dawn of humankind, which would be about 200,000 years ago, and then all of a sudden, 6,000 years ago with the rise of civilization, all, all of a sudden you have this break from indig indigenous, uh, um, you know, ways of seeing things. And uh, I, I like to quote the Bible where, you know, God said, you know, you can eat of any, you can in, eat of any tree of the, in the Garden of Eden except for one, which is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And uh, the next line is interesting. It says, for if you do so, you will surely die. And so I interpreted that as, uh, you know, the civilization, basically people putting themselves, deciding that they have this special 
permission of sorts to, you know, to make themselves the top of the heap, so to speak. And, um, you know, that's uh, created a system in which uh, civilization is seen as the pinnacle of human achievement. But, you know, what does it do to everything else in the world? What does it do to, you know, to the natural world, right? It simply treats them as uh, objects to be, you know, to be exploited and controlled and, you know, reduced to, to wealth or whatever, resources. And so that's to me, is uh, the picture of why, as, uh, as I charted in my book, as time goes on, indigenous people all over the world are, are subjugated. Their lands and territories are taken. And, um, you know, uh, they're, um, you know, they're uh, reduced uh, to being, you know, almost irrelevant elements of uh, the world population. But uh, as I point out in my research, it's only really been since about the 1820s that non-Indigenous people became the world majority world population. So it's not, uh, you know, it's only, it's really, you know, a civil, a so-called civilization only started with very small numbers and it took a lot of time to develop, but all of a sudden, you know, so over the last 200 years, it's really just sort of exploded as, uh, as a dominant ideology. But I mean, in terms of the vast sweep of, um, Humanity and and uh, and time it's 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 really nothing you know, and um, I uh, point out as well that the average mammalian species that are closest to us should last for a million years and we've been here two hundred thousand years yeah so far and you know we have another eight hundred thousand to go if we're gonna kind of um, you know uh, be as uh, successful in surviving as other mammalian species and so you know you kind of you know, when you look at it at that time frame, it really, you know, it really makes you question what course is best. And as I sometimes say, who has the better survival strategy? Is it the, is it the guy with leather and feathers or is it the guy, you know, sitting in his, his Cadillac smoking his cigar? Well, I think that, you know, in Saskatchewan, we have a large indigenous population. We have, uh, you know, we've had a lot of advancements in indigenous education, although it's still, you know, far from uh, where it should be. We have, of course, First Nations University of Canada, which is a unique institution, post-secondary institution, one of the very few indigenous controlled, what you might call universities, where, you know, we really can, um, you know, do research our own way in a, you know, in a way which respects spiritual protocols and which respects our, our values and, you know, like incorporates an appreciation of spirituality. And so, yeah, you know, we, we do have a lot of uh, very, very good Indigenous uh, scholars in Saskatchewan. And uh, I think it's, uh, you know, the onus is upon us to, you know, really show that, uh, you know, when we do this research and when we write and when we produce knowledge, that it is respectful of our cultural and spiritual inher inheritance or heritage. And that, uh, you know, when we express it, we do it in a way in which uh, it really does show that we're not simply, you know, parroting, for example, the research methods and the whatever you want to call the intellectual paradigms of, uh, of Western universities. And, uh, you know, the elders tell us that, uh, you know, there's... Um, problems coming and even non-indigenous scholars say that you know things are you know sort of evolving in a way in which we need to have a new paradigm a new way of kind of approaching things and so you know I think it's important for us uh, to you know you know when when we uh, do this type of work to really bring the spirituality first and foremost as uh, as the foundation of our knowledge because you know I do believe that uh, it was foundational knowledge. I always, my understanding of uh, the way we traditionally obtain knowledge is one of the first things we did is we prayed and we went into ceremonies when we were asking these questions. And, you know, we, you know, we had these, we carried out these um, inter interrogations or inquiries in a very spiritual way. 
And I sometimes point to chemistry as an example of how this can make a difference. So, you know, if you are a student going, uh, wanting to have a chemistry degree, you, know, you simply take the classes, you study the textbooks, memorize the formulas, pass your exams, and you've got a chemistry degree, you can go and work and do different things. You can make, you know, new chemicals, right? You can make new pharmaceuticals and all kind of stuff. But that's not indigenous chemistry. To me, indigenous chemistry involves a uh, spiritual component. If you have spiritual, if you have indigenous chemistry, you know, what I basically say is you wouldn't have chemicals that would be destroying the environment. You know, you wouldn't have chemicals that, that uh, you know, are, are simply there that nobody really knows what, what they do or that are simply there to make money. That's not indigenous chemistry. Indigenous chemistry is respectful and it's, it's, it's done with wisdom. And so that's, that's the missing element. You know, we need to um, find a way to, you know, incorpor <coughs> incorporate the spirituality, which uh, I, I like to refer to as a higher form of intelligence, back into our research and our, our writing and our publication. Uh, otherwise, we're basically just doing the same thing that, that uh, all the other scholars are doing, right? We're just producing information. You know, sure, we um, you know, might get some more insight into history or whatever, but you know, I think that uh, you know, we need to um, ask ourselves uh, you know, if we are um, you know, spiritual beings on a, on a, on a physical journey, what's, what's the value of this knowledge? You know, is this knowledge really helping us on our you know, like on our, you know, in terms of our human mis mission, you know. The, uh, the other resources, the most valuable resources, I'd say, are the elders themselves. You know, they're the ones who really, obviously, carry the traditional information. As I say, I could not have written my books without their input and guidance and support and uh, knowledge, and, you know, they are the ones who, you know, teach traditional knowledge with, you know, like with, in, with, with integrity. You know, they may not get up there like a classroom instructor and go over points A, B, C, and D, but, you know, what they say and the way they say it, you know, I've always found that, uh, you know, they have something, something uh, meaningful and inspirational to say. Yeah, my books are really good. I think that, uh, you know, people should buy them and read them. There's The Knowledge Seeker, which came out in 2016, and Loss of Indigenous Eden, which came out in 2020.